ideas that you can put in the ground the next time you resurface a road, for example. Good resources for you if you have any questions after this. So break time, we're gonna do half time here. And then next session is, how did Milton take all that and create something that's unique to us and relevant to our problems, relevant to our stakeholders, our mayor and council, everything that makes Milton unique. So step one, and this is a recommendation for everyone in the room, whenever you're doing a plan, you want to acknowledge and respect and incorporate other plans as, most, as, as much as you can. Uh, the first thing we did when, our, when we were looking at our local road safety plan is we took that goal at the very top of the screen from our strategic plan and from our comp plan that we had just finished the last year. Uh, this is why we're doing the local road safety plan. We identified uh, as a city that we want to implement a transportation infrastructure that meets needs, accounts for future growth, and allows residents to traverse in a calm, safe, efficient manner. Uh, it's that simple. Once we, uh, we all, we didn't really have to do any consensus building for that because that was already given to us. That was a previous plan. Uh, we took that, we fleshed it out a little bit, we created our vision and we created our mission. I'm not gonna read those to you on the stage, but it's very important to set those out and physically write them down uh, before you start doing anything. Um, it's something that if things go awry and things go complicated later on, you're able to bring yourselves back to are we really focusing on why we started this project? Are we focusing on the vision? Are we focusing on the mission? Quick schedule, uh, none of you uh, probably can see anything there on the right, but uh, it took us about a year and a half to complete our local road safety plan. That's because for the first 12 months, we were trying to do this in-house, and during COVID and during some staff turnover, it just physically wasn't, uh, it wasn't in our, in our capability to push it across the finish line. So late last year, uh, last fall of 21, uh, we partnered with KCI Technologies, Andrew sitting in the back. Uh, Andrew helped us a lot with uh, pushing this over the finish line, looking at data, helping us identify projects, uh, do a lot of the public meetings. We had several rounds of surveys and public input meetings uh, earlier this year. We are optimistically looking at a plan adoption uh, as actually scheduled to be yesterday. We had our council meeting canceled. Uh, plan adoption should be for us in early August. Uh, we defined the process into five steps. Uh, leadership and stakeholders, looking at the solutions, implementing our solutions, and then that living document and out, uh, idea of how are we monitoring and how are we tweaking in the future. Specific to Milton, uh, we looked at the data, we looked at what, we, what the problems we have, what we're hearing from residents, what we're hearing from council, and we came up with the six uh, emphasis areas. You saw, I was shocked at the number of uh, vehicle to animal crashes we have uh, every year. It's it's ridiculous. It's enough of a problem for us that it's part of our local road safety plan. We need to think about it. Uh, we took those six focus areas, we created this nice little table, and we divided, we tried to, as best we can, come up with the three E's again, education, engineering, and enforcement, spanning those six uh, focus areas. We had a lot of engineering countermeasures on roadway and shoulder conditions and intersections, obviously. And then we were able to check with conversations with our PD for the six boxes on the enforcement end as well. Uh, stakeholders and outreach, I'm not gonna go over this in great depth. We had a lot of public meetings. We had a lot of surveys. Uh, surveys are great because we get 500 to 600 plus people responding versus public meetings. No one shows up anymore. Uh, even if you do online, you're lucky to get 10 or 20. Uh, what were the people saying we should be looking at uh, for engineering measures? Uh, speeds, uh, safety edge and shoulder treatments, uh, looking at specific speed limit zones, and then installing uh, potentially median refuge islands for a little bit of that horizontal deflection to not only slow people down, but to provide some of those safer pedestrian crossings. And then straight from the survey, uh, these were this what the people told us. Uh, what were they looking for for educational campaigns? Uh, rules of the road for roundabouts, rules of the road for the bike riders, rules of the road for the vehicles navigating the bike riders, and then uh, awareness of potential speed-related crashes and uh, aggressive driving. Yes. 
skip that. Survey results, I'm going to skip. Uh, this presentation will be available electronically if you'd like to see it. Uh, we reviewed five years of crash data in the city, averaging over 600 crashes a year with a vast majority not being injury, thankfully, 42% uh, being rear end. But we started looking at where the hot spots were in conjunction with our roadway conditions. So we were able to use uh, tools as simple as Google Maps Street View and taking a truck and driving out and looking at it. Um, roadway conditions, we reviewed 18 of our major streets. Uh, streets selected just based on some institutional knowledge, some feedback we got from the residents, uh, conversations we've had before with the state DOT about speed limits and potential reductions. We know where the, the sensitive areas are and we, we focused on that when we were developing our plan. The repeat. What do we get out of this? So six major priorities that the city define uh, through, again, education enforcement and education uh, enforcement and engineering. Uh, conversations that we had after looking at all the data, after looking at all the public outreach, uh, here are the six things that we, uh, priorities that we're gonna be taking out of this plan uh, that we're gonna be focusing on uh, most in the future. Uh, number one is just a statement that we're gonna be rolling out some of those nine educational campaigns that I showed you before, um, every three months, every four months on a quarterly basis. Uh, number two, if you're in local government and you haven't heard about Safe Streets for All, uh, you need to look into it quickly. Um, it's an amazing grant opportunity. Uh, you'll be hearing more about it, I think, in a session tomorrow. The first time in history, direct funding from the federal government to cities and counties. Uh, that's never happened before. It's happening with a grant deadline in September. Um, the fun thing is Federal Highway has decided that they're going to break the grant into two different categories. They're going to break the plan. They're going to break the grant into uh, planning studies and implementation studies. So the, the rule for implementation studies is you can't get implementation funding until you have a plan. So the, the, the idea behind this from Federal Highway is they anticipate year one, year two of these selections, they're going to be funding a lot of what I just said, a local road safety plans for cities and counties that haven't gotten them yet. Um, for those of us that are a little bit ahead of the curve, um, we get a year or two head start on everyone else. Uh, we're able to go after those implementation funding. Uh, Five billion dollars over five years. Uh, that's crazy, crazy amount of money. Obviously, they're, they're going to spread it across all the states. Obviously, they're going to spread it across urban counties, rural counties. They're going to get a good diverse mix. But it's 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 a very exciting thing for uh, the locals to try and decrease that 580 number that I showed you earlier. Um, I'm not going to read all these. Um, funding is really important. Um, while you're doing your plan, you should be thinking about how easily you're going to be able to deliver uh, what the plan comes out. Uh, is that a local splost? Is that a local general fund and bond uh, potentially? Is, is it something that you're just going to have to, if you're a small enough city and county, you're going to have to rely on the state DOT to assist? Or are there other grant opportunities like I just talked about? Is there federal funding that you're going to have to go after? in order to start delivering some of the, uh, some of the items. I'm not gonna read these. Uh, phase one, phase two, this is how we kind of prioritized some of our educational campaigns. Let me skip. Uh, we broke our engineering countermeasures into three phases. We, first bucket we defined as 15 months, something that's very easy as for us to identify and low cost. Uh, phase two being one to four years out, and then phase three being after four. Here's a list of the engineering countermeasures uh, that we prioritize, you see in bold. Uh, reviewing posted speed limits, uh, enhancing pavement markings, adding RPMs, uh, curve warning signs, uh, installation of shared use paths, uh, updating the sidewalk and bicycle uh, priority network uh, plan for the city, installing and consistently applying advanced intersection warning signs and a, a safety study at several key uh, individual intersections. This is just a timeline of where we are in this study. 
or in those first two blocks. Uh, well, again, hopefully have an adopted plan in a couple of weeks. We're gonna be talking about a Vision Zero resolution, which I know many of you have heard about. Uh, not many, I would say not many cities and counties in Georgia have done that. Um, it's a little bit more popular. You see a little bit more progressive side of the country, but it's important to us. It's actually uh, one of the metrics that Federal Highway is using to decide whether they give you the grant funding or not and whether you have a Vision Zero resolution. So it's something that we're doing as well as seeking that grant and then beginning to deliver with some of our T plus funding. Now the fun part of the presentation. <laughs> Those of you who are older in the room probably recognize what that movie is. Some of the younger people probably don't. Um, I've, I've got one last challenge for you. Uh, first part of the presentation, I asked you to, to think about safety every hour of every day you walk in. Um, second challenge is a little bit fun. Um, I've got a little ba bag of Milton swag that's sitting over behind the table there. For the first three people that raise their hands. <laughs> Still speaking. <laughs> that can answer the question that I'm about to throw on the screen. So I'm gonna give you a list of names, and actually I've seen two of these people at the conference. They're names that you're gonna recognize. I need somebody to raise their hand and tell me what these people have in common. And it's not their IT members or their professional engineers. I'm looking for something a little bit more specific than that. So here's the list of names. What do these people have in common? I'm looking for three people to guess. Raise your hand. Marwan. I need more than that. <laughs> Wayne. No. One more. Chala. No. That's okay. Each of you are going to get Milton swag anyway. Come up afterwards. Here's what they have in common. They all serve their cities and counties in a volunteer basis. Um, it's so important, coming from a selfish local government person. Um, if I can do anything in this presentation, one or two of you, research where you live, research what's going on in your city and your county, and we need more common sense, smart, technically trained, ethical engineers serving on these boards and commissions. They're so important. They guide so much of your development of your community more than you would ever realize. And it's not about being a politician and seeking elected office. There are a couple of people on there that did that, but that the majority of engineers that, that, that spend this volunteer time aren't politicians and seeking elected office. They're going on to the Board of Zoning Appeals or they're serving on their Recreation Commission. They're serving on their comp plan for their, for their 2050 comp plan for their county. There are so many opportunities for everyone to get involved. Um, on using, the, using your city and county website, contacting your local officials, uh, volunteering, just saying, hey, I've lived here for five years, I'm raising my family here, and I want to look for, I want to know how I can help. Um, you'd be amazed how difficult it is sometimes for the local officials to actually find people that want uh, those spots. That's it for me. Uh, we're saving questions for the end. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. I'm actually in the thick of time. I'm going to minimize my introduction to Sam. We all know Sam Harris. He is a integral part of our safety team now. He's going to talk about how he's transformed the safety program. Uh, he Obviously, I ended up graduating with his master's degree from tech, and he likes going on long walks on the beach with his wife and kids. That is excellent. Thank you, Scott. All right. So first off, I want to start out the presentation by saying everything's a collective effort in all the programs and all the departments of the DOT. So from the top all the way down to, the, to entry level um, positions that we have. So it's just not one person. So three takeaways. What is the GDOT Safety Engineering Program? When you walk out, if that hasn't been beaten in you in the past two years with me uh, presenting, then we're gonna, we're gonna nail that down. Uh, what changes can be done to transform a safety, or transform a program, and what are the impact of those transformational changes? So let's do a quick introduction. What type of funds does the safety program use? We use Highway Safety Improvement Program Funds, otherwise known as HSIP. These are federal funds. Um, really to get down to it, 
They can only be used in certain ways, and you have to justify their use based on a data-driven solution. Uh, so there, there's a lot of strings tied attached to this one. What's the vision of the safety program? We'll reduce fatalities and injury crashes on Georgia roadways by utilizing a safety data-driven approach. And we have many objectives, many emphasis areas that we look in. Head, bike, roadway departure, lane departure, intersection, off system, align those with the goals of our stakeholders, including our strategic highway safety plan. State safety performance targets. If you really boil down to what really matters in terms of um, what we have to present to the federal government, it's these five performance measures. We report these each year in our HSIP report. Um, they're a five-year rolling average. Each state has to meet their goals or make significant progress towards their goals. And if you don't, there are ramifications in terms of the apportionment uh, spend, and also you have to develop an HSIP implementation plan. Let's talk a little bit about the history of the program to kind of set up to where, where, uh, where the changes were coming from. So how is the program managed? And we're taking a, a look back in time here, but there was one person looking in three different areas. So crash data management, engineering, which is project development, and your project delivery. These are jobs on their own, which you'll soon find out what the solution was, but from context, crash data management Average 400,000 crashes a year that you're responsible for even refining down to the uh, fatality level, which averaged around 15, 1,600 a year, a little bit higher over the past couple of years. But, and then being able to snap those, work with local agencies with the 150 plus counties that we have, and, and make sure that those get coded into our database correctly. That's a lot of effort. Then the engineering uh, perspective of that and the project development, take that data, analyze it, try to figure out where the best projects are and be able to justify that in terms of the spin. And then finally, the project delivery. Before program delivery took over um, and, and delivered our projects, that was this one person taking it from concept design all the way to construction. So a considerable amount of effort going into that. So what was the solution to that? This was one of the defining moments for the safety program. Let's break that position out. Um, and that's exactly what we did in terms of the project delivery. Uh, that was around 2015, and actually Miss Sue Ann was, was one of the ones, it was the one that actually took that role and was a defining moment for the program, and you'll see through the data that I present uh, later. Next decision, in 2018, let's break out the engineering position, and let's bring in someone to focus solely on that. Again, these changes had profound impacts on how the program moved forward after that point. So let's talk a little bit about the contract. There are two contracts back, and we'll go all the way back to 2010. $3 million a piece that covered the entire state, $6 million in total. A lot of the projects that were developed at this time were grander in scale because of the capacity that we were working with. Let's fast forward a little bit, all the way to 2016. New contracts came out with new regions, um, with the Atkins, Arcadis, and AECOM. Now it jumped up to $10 million a piece on these contracts, so that's $30 million in capacity. $6 million all the way to $30 million. Growth there. It's good. With the newest contracts, 19 to 2022, ending on 2022, the firms were lucky enough to win their regions back. But we increased that capacity back up to, up to $20 million. So now we went from $6 million, $30 million, to $60 million in capacity for the safety program. Other contracts under the safety program that many people don't realize, um, there's 11 regional commission contracts that we do every single year and working directly with our regional commissions. Well, PEDS, when it was PEDS, we had a contract with them, Georgia Bikes. The entire Safe Routes of School program is underneath the safety program. Teens in the driver's seat, and one of our new additions is the Let's E43. So, started the transformation, December 2018. So happens to be right about the time that I started the program. Again, top down, context, all the other stuff. <laughs> so, when I sat down, there's two things that were told upon me that they wanted to see. We need to get faster in delivering projects, and we need to be proactive. We can't be reactive in, when we're looking at crashes. We need to be proactive as well. Uh, so they sent me to a National Safety Engineering Peer-to-Peer -peer Conference, 150 practitioners, all state, uh, everybody from the states. There's a lot of things I learned from that conference that I'll be able to highlight throughout here. But the first thing we did is we sat down and said, let's look at the way that we categorize the severity of our crashes. Let's update to the CAPCO scale 
let's get a more defined structure in terms of the co benefit costs that are associated with, with these crashes and highly focusing on the fatal and serious injury which align to our goals. Project standardization and prioritization. One thing that we quickly were able to adapt and, and improve upon was projects that were progressing through the program out to delivery and in the delivery of the program, there were certain steps that we saw that we could be improved. And, and that was mainly um, making sure that we had a solid scope and that the, the scope was understood on the other side. This is a data-driven process. We don't skip any step. And if we do skip a step, it has to be signed off on. So one of those steps is the crash screening. This is the three to four page document that is the second step in our process. The sole intent of this is to make a decision, should we move forward with a safety project? We look at right away, projects that are in the area, traffic volumes, whoops, sorry, collision diagrams, standardize the way that we looked at crashes. This is the crash table. This is the standard way that you, um, you, when you pull the data, this is what it should look like. And this made it consistent across all the projects. So we're able to compare one to one to one and be able to really analyze and get down to the trends. We look at probe speed data, and of course, the safety BC. And the safety BC is good enough, we're moving to the next step and go to ICE. But if it's not good enough, either most of the time through district staff or whatever the case may be. Traffic engineering study updates. There's several updates that we went through and, and highlighted, but I bolted out some for the sake of time. Detailed layouts. One of the issues that we were seeing as projects were progressing through the program into delivery, the designs changed. Sometimes it was a tweak here and there, but sometimes I would pull it up and said, that's completely different. Um, we need to figure out how we got to this point. So by institutionalizing that's a detailed layout in the traffic engineering study, it helps progress it through the delivery process to make sure that in concept, it looks uh, the way that it should look and then going into design. Desktop environmental screenings, another big positive in terms of being able to identify risk associated with a project. He actually gets the project and they start developing a task order. They already know what to look for and how to build their task order from an environmental sense. Risk analysis, utility, right away, interim measure documentation. When projects are routed through um, internally and we're looking at those, we need to make sure that we're documenting interim measures because not everybody knows that we're putting in the interim measure or that the long-term measure is still um, justified even if we're putting in the short-term measure. Next is road safety audits. We have road safety audits or have had road safety audits that are six plus miles in length that have over 200 recommendations. And it takes a lot of time and effort to do a road safety audit at that scale. So one thing that we quickly um, brought into, into the picture was coming up with a guideline. First thing on that guideline, no RSA over a mile long. Um, that was important because we need to be able to find a dedicated area through a data-driven process and focus on that area. Another thing that we did was we um, have an expert panel review every single recommendation that is that it, when an RSA is in draft. Promote the program. Here I am right now, promoting the program, talking about it, saying why it's cool, um, saying why it's important. Uh, through ITE, um, even the other organizations like AAA, the Eastern Transportation Coalition, which I have a presentation next week if you want to catch that one, um, local road safety plans, partnerships with FHWA, uh, <laughs> the Regional Safety Task Force, Governor's Office, and two things I want to highlight here from a national stage, our multimodal uh, safety analysis study focus up in the top right-hand corner, a little piggy bank. A wise person once told me, that think of each person like a piggy bank. Every time you go talk to that person and you help that person, you're depositing a penny in that piggy bank. One day, whenever you go to that person and you need help and you need something from them, you break open that piggy bank and take all your pennies back and they're gonna help you. But if you break open that piggy bank and there's nothing there, should you really expect for them to help you or not? So I take that in stride. So through the, my time, um, and working in the safety program, I wanted to foster relationships with planning, with communications, maintenance. One thing I can announce right now, now, we sat down with maintenance and said, wouldn't be a great idea if we reviewed all of the resurfacing projects in the state from the safety program's perspective and hand you comments and, let, and, and, then, and then we can implement these things. They're all within scope. Great idea. Let's move forward with it. Uh, OPD, I ha there's a standing meeting every other week just to talk with OPD about our projects and making sure they're progressing forward. 
to environmental and bridge. We need to figure out how to report and come up with as many count, uh, many performance measures as we can, then boil it down to an executive summary and let the let executive management and our management know that what we're doing is making an impact. So what we did is we developed an executive dashboard for the safety program and the operational program at the same time. And new metric, I'm not going to go into. We, were, we talked about it here, and then we're going to talk about it again, but I can't say enough in terms of how fast and efficient this makes us. In the past, it would take us weeks to get through data analysis. Now it could take minutes or hours. In-town safety analysis study. Huge effort, collaborative effort amongst uh, many departments within, uh, many groups within the DOT. What I really want to highlight here is over on the right-hand side. These are areas that uh, are, are project locations that we identified in the study that are currently under design or that are um, uh, finishing up studies. That was a big deal for me um, and a lot of other states because based on the old rules for HSIP, you cannot buy non-infrastructure piece, uh, you cannot do non-infrastructure spends. So I sat down with FHWA, deposited a couple pennies in the piggy bank, and got them to agree that the state of Georgia would be able to purchase equipment for locals. To date, we've spent over a million dollars with this program and been able to put in devices like RFBs at, at uh, middle schools, elementary schools, et cetera. Another thing I learned at this conference, how do we speed things up? And that was one of the things I needed to, get, I needed to really uh, tackle whenever I got into the position. But safety MOSD. Came back from the conference, sat down with uh, the OPD, deposited as many pennies as I could in that instance, and said, what can we do? What can we do to speed this up? Uh, we sat down with different groups, environmental, um, engineering services, et cetera, and to determine that it took us a year. It took us a year to develop the task order and develop the plan, but everybody was on the same page. So when they see a safety MOSD project come along, they understand what it is. Now, what type of projects we can tackle? And just to give it a little bit of context on that, that's 61 additional projects for the safety program just running through MOSD in the past year alone that has probably around 20 to $50 million of construction tied to it. And that's on top of the 60 to 100 projects that the safety program already does. So what's next? IDIQ. People in my inner circle are laughing at me right now because I'm bringing this up. But we've made significant strides in this area as well. And what this is, is it's going to give the opportunity for the, for the safety program to have an on-call contractor to do maintenance activities. We estimate that 80% of our recommendations from RSAs are going to be able to accomplish through this IDIQ, which is big, not from just the safety program's perspective, but from a district perspective, from a local government perspective. Resources are slim. If we're able to take that back and off their plate and get it implemented, and that's, that's huge. Uh, connected vehicle data. There's enough discussion on this as well. Harsh braking, harsh acceleration, those are the easy ones for safety to take that data and justify projects with. But what about seatbelt usage? We can get that data as well. We could take that data, and I've already talked with communications about this. Let's plan outreach to those areas of the state that we see drop in, in seatbelt usage based on this data. Predictive and near-miss analysis, Ron did a great job in a previous presentation on that, if you're able to catch that. Now, educational outreach. I'm going to show you a quick video. This is actually very innovative and, and a really unique approach in terms of what a state DOT is looking at. We actually have partnered with Let's See 43, and we're able to identify an outreach program for safety. And again, that wasn't always the case that we could do that, but now with the new infrastructure law, we can spend HSIP dollars on non-infrastructure. We partner with them on several different things. These right here, these lanyards, get passed out through our HERO and CHAMP programs um, to, to users on our roadway. Uh, we, have a, we have a communication aspect where we do social media spins and we do uh, billboards and we do a safe driving summit. And then I can explain it to you, but I think it's a lot better if I'm able to show you what it actually is. The number of crashes and injuries and fatalities on our roadways on an annual basis are going the wrong direction. They're going upward. Really our sole purpose is to reduce that number. If we don't have to make those phone calls to those family members saying, that, hey, that your loved one's not coming home. It knows no social economic group. I mean, it could happen to anybody. And it's because of a preventable traffic accident. It's an awesome feeling to be able to drive. But there is so many dangers. If these students leave here educated to do the right thing while I drive, make sure you're not distracted, make sure you wear your seatbelt, Make sure you make good decisions 
and make sure that you give yourself enough time to react if you react. This summit will have done well. We have uh, signed a multi-year agreement with the Georgia Department of Transportation. I'm on the campus of the University of West Georgia today for our inaugural Teen Safe Driving Summit. When you lose a son, um, you want to honor him? I'd just be remiss if we didn't look at what we can do so other parents don't end up in my wife Mary's shoes, my shoes. So I'm motivated to get in front of these teens because I want these kids to learn that you can lose your life with a poor series of decisions in a quick time frame. When you look at the numbers of fatalities and serious injuries on our roadways, it's, it's alarming. Last year alone, over 40,000 deaths across the country in Georgia, 1,700 fatalities. I mean, that's multiple fatalities happening every single day. Distracted driving has accounted for 50% of all fatalities, and that number's just exponentially gotten larger. 16 to 24 is the age bracket that's usually most involved in accidents. They're just not aware of the big picture. You have a father who loses uh, a son, and he goes and tells that story and turns it into something productive for others. That's part of our mission as a university, right? It's, it's to teach. We're gonna be bringing high schoolers into a five-hour event that starts with a keynote address that I'll deliver. Then they're gonna go to four powerful breakouts that will be led by an insurance company, a healthcare company, a trucking and transportation company, and then multiple levels of law enforcement. Having a summit in your city is a fantastic way to connect with the adolescent population who's at greatest risk. Even saving just one life from one of these conversations and these presentations is something that I believe every community should embrace and want to participate in, and, and it will be something that can impact many lives to come. So this is, again, groundbreaking for us as a DOT and also from a national perspective, and it really hones in on the behavioral aspects of safety. Uh, we as engineers, we can do a lot in terms of design, but from the behavioral aspect and this affordability and flexibility from, from the government in terms of our ACIP fund, this is, this is huge, especially driving into, we are right in front of students that are getting their permit or they're just started driving. Um, that, wasn't, that was the first summit. We're having many, many more. Uh, throughout the course of the next year. The next one's actually going to be in Statesboro. So if y'all are interested in that, uh, it'll be coming up in September. So measuring success, we've gone through a lot of changes, stepped you through the program. How do we look at the measure of success? I'll take you back to those state safety performance targets. The first year that it was eligible in terms of being able to be checked up on because of the five-year rolling average was 2018. We unfortunately did not make that. I can give you a lot of reasons why, but um, but I won't, because we took that as we need to do better. So we developed the HSIP implementation plan, identified areas that we can get better at. Since then, in 19 and 20, we have checked the box. We have met or significantly made progress towards these goals. And the new 2021 um, is coming out in, in, in March of next year. So looking at it from a safety program spin, we, uh, starting in 2020, we have spent over the allotment. So anytime any, any management uh, from GDOT comes to me and says, hey, do you have some extra projects? Do you want to spend more money? Absolutely. E even if I'm not, if I'm still 99%, even if that 1%, I, I have advantage of that um, with, with a great team behind me to be able to spend 170 million. I'm going to show you the impact of that. Then we went in and spent 128 to 158 uh, uh, the following years. Are the projects actually working? We get the data from national perspective studies, but is it working in Georgia? Well, our cuts, 89% reduction um, across the board in terms of severity. Roundabout, same thing, 80% reduction for injury and fatality. Cable barrier, 35. Rumble strips, 48% decrease. These are Georgia numbers, by the way. They're not numbers for anywhere else. And just looking at today, looking at the fatalities, 19% reduction in our fatalities compared to this time last year for roadway departure. 28% in terms of the lane departure crashes. That $50 million that we spent, not gonna give all the credit in the world to that, but that's having a huge impact to what we're seeing on our state. And then pedestrian hybrid begins with 86%. Lastly, 
got some new contracts to announce. Mostly everybody knows, but I'm just going to take it as an opportunity to announce it anyway. But um, we have a new regent with Kimley Horn as a new team that's coming on to the safety contract. They're taking over districts one and four, Arcadis three and six, Atkins with two and five, and AECOM with, with district seven. It was, believe it or not, data-driven in our decisions on how to break this, th these districts up. Um, but a, a fair amount of crashes, even when you look at rates, District 7 deserved to have its own contract. Now, what's the money spend on that? $25 million in capacity for each of these contracts. So remind you, $6 million, $30 million, $60 million, now we're at $100 million. That shows growth for a program that's an outstanding. So three takeaways. You know what the safety, uh, GDOT Safety Engineering Program is. You saw the changes that we did to transform the program, and you saw the impact of those changes. So with that, I know we're taking questions at the end, but thank you so much for your time. Now it's gonna be really tough for us to follow up behind Sam. Probably should have structured this a little bit better so that Danny and I had a little bit easier and didn't have to follow up behind him. Um, Danny and I are gonna co-present, really just gonna really lay the groundwork for Danny to be able to get up here and do a demo new metric. So. Um, and Danny, I think instead of doing an intro, I'll, I think he gets the prize. He flew all the way in from Utah. Did anyone come farther away than Utah to be able to come for this conference? Yeah, so you, you get the prize. So I think you get something out of the goodie bag there for that. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So really, uh, what we're going to cover today is just kind of give a really quick history. I'm going to run through these slides really quick because the most important part is have Danny go through the demo and he's going to be doing a live demo, hopefully as long as everything works good. Prior to the metric, as most of you guys know, we had gears that was out there. It's a portal that worked good to be able to get in and get crash data, but you know it was cumbersome. It definitely didn't have the analytics in there. Um, we were we were really lucky to be able to get through Dave Adams. We really did a lot of searching through the systems that were out there and found new metric. And so we've been a partner with them for three years. The biggest advantages of new metric is it gets you the ability to be able to visualize the crash data and really pushes the envelope on how we're able to go through and filter it. And so getting a tool like that in front of in front of our safety groups, in front of Sam's groups, where they can sit there and go in and mine things out and find filters to be able to get, go in and find safe, safety and crash improvements, that's really where the power of Numetric comes in. Um, what's changed at Numetric a little bit is interesting is that when we picked up Numetric, we were one of the first states that picked it up. Um, GDOT was, I think, the third state that picked it up. Utah obviously had one since Danny was out there pimping them to Utah, so that was easy for them. But really, now they've been picked up by Ashtoware. So if anyone's familiar with Ashtoware, Ashtoware used to have the, the safety analyst software. It really wasn't getting implemented by very many states. Ashtoware decided, hey, look, we need to go in and come up with the new software that people are going to implement and people use. So they decided to go out on their own. They actually did a lot of questions with us and the other states that were actually early implementers and said, and we, we were the ones that were saying, yeah, new metric is awesome. It's doing everything we need to do and then some. So Ashtoware has now picked up uh, new metric as their safety software. And so now I think we're the only state left that hasn't transitioned over to Ashtoware safety. There's several states that have picked up Ashtoware. I think there's like eight states now. And then the couple of states that were before us have transitioned over to Ashtoware safety as opposed to just being our direct contract with new metric. Um, Dave has been very integral and a part. Dave Adams has been a big part of the users group to be able to sit there and get implementation in there. And I'm actually part of a um, part of the advisory committee that kind of steers how Ashtoware wants that software to go so that it actually helps other states to be able to make it more attractive and usable for those states so that they want to get in there and use the software. In Georgia, I hit a couple of these really quick. One of the reasons why we're able to have a really good bisection is because we get a lot of users that use it. Not only all our different safety consultant teams, but a lot of our districts go in. So we we have it. It doesn't sound that dramatic, but we have 160 over 160 in a month new users or unique users that are using it. And over a six month period of time, oh well over 300. In other states, are nowhere near those numbers. So we're getting tons and tons of people out there using the software for all kinds of different things. And it's not just GDOT. I mean, DDOT's the middle number, the 104. Really, the you know, it, it's our it's our consultants that are using it. It's it's local governments that are using it, and it, it's it's really powerful. And I think people are using it. And that's why the numbers are there. It's people going in, trying it out. They're seeing how great it is, moving along with it. And 
you know, we also have a public portal. So the public portal is a little bit different as opposed to the previous two slides where someone's going in and they use a, a, an identifier where they go in and they can log in. If you need it at the end, we got Dave Adams' email on there, I think. You can go into a, um, you can go in and get a password and when you do, then you can save all your searches and all that. But through the public portal, you can get almost all the same information, but it's just out there through the public portal. You can go in there, do a search, get your information and dump it out and move on. And, and, and we're getting over 2000 hits in, in that site. Um, really where we've been pushing the, um, the envelope and trying to push really Danny's group and we keep on challenging him with new things. It's, it's really funny to say we have weekly meetings with new metric and we do a call with them and, and it's, it's a time well invested to be able to sit there and really push new metric on what we need out of them. And what that's gotten for us is by pushing them on what we need within the contract, we're able to do things like our overrepresentation uh, report, which essentially identifies where are you seeing, you know, data that's overrepresented. Where do you really need to focus things on? Um, we're about to be rolling out collision diagrams sometime really soon, and and left turn movement analysis is something that I think Danny's going to show in his in his demo, where you know, for like someone that's trying to do signal permits, it shows you the ability within. You know, I can probably do it, and, and I'm, not a, I'm not a super user. In 30, 45 seconds, I can pull up a crash diagram that shows, you know, all the left versus opposing through crashes at a signalized intersection. Um, what we're working on next, and this kind of goes right into what Rob was talking about before, we're building a template, a local road safety plan template that allows a local government to go in and use new metric to essentially pre-can a local, a local road safety plan. And you know what we're trying to do is get the right information out there because really the big thing is that's the hardest struggle is not everybody's invested the effort that Rob's put into it, and so we're trying to get all the other states a simple tool that can go in and plug in the data and 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 spits out a, a you know a, a, the beginnings of a report that they can go and manipulate all of our curve in, information we're putting in there so we're integrating all that data into the system and then we're also we've got you know as federally mandated we've got some equity numbers that we're putting in there and we'd be able to be able to do filters based on that so. Now our uh, our Utah he comes in. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for having me. I didn't know if you guys would since I wasn't from Georgia, but appreciate it. Um, all right. A couple of last things that we're doing at Numetric before we jump into the demo. Um, predictive analysis. If anybody was in there listening to Ron's presentation, like this is the way that everybody's moving, and it's because it's the right thing. Like waiting until there's a fatality is not as good as stopping the fatality. So most of us can agree on that. Um, visualizing roadway. So because we have such a crazy demographic spice between people who actually know the nine digit number for the route ID in Georgia to someone who has never heard of anything but the roadway name, we're going to visualize all the roadways in an upcoming release. So you can just go click on the roadways and make your uh, make your queries and those kind of things. So we're making it easier and easier. We have this real push pull of make it as easy as possible, put predictive analysis and really complicated uh, calculations in there, right? So it's a fine balancing act. And then Georgia has been pushing us with a couple of vendors to say, hey, we need help understanding, not help, but can we actually put these into metric and get real information out of it, including connected vehicles and counts and, and those kind of things. So we're working on a couple pilot programs for those. Um, so let's jump into the demo. Um, okay, before I get too far in the demo, Scott talked about the public portal. Um, if you ever want to get to the public portal, just go to Google and type in G dot crash data. And then crash reporting is the very first thing that comes up. It takes you to George's website. And it's that first thing, just view the dashboard. It's that easy. It takes you into the dashboards, which will load and eventually. Um, but nothing like A, live demos, B, live demos on a hotel's Wi-Fi. But um, that will load as it's loading. We'll go back over to it. Well, so you can go through, and this is kind of built for you in a dashboard format. You can come in. Say, I just want to see the who. And GDOT is already, and this isn't my computer, so I always have, yeah, there we go. GDOT's broken up some of the things they talked about, young drivers and, and how they drive crashes. Terrible pun that wasn't meant. 
Um, but go through and there's there's a whole bunch of things you can get out of this. If you ever want to add filters, I'll show you how to in just a second. In the other uh, in whole new metric, like as a logged in customer or user. Okay. So here's my favorite part about new metric. If I want to come in and look at pedestrian crashes, I can come in and type in pedestrian and it's going to give me everything. And I just want to, I want to see the true pedestrian crashes, right? And let's say I want to do it in the city of Brunswick. There you go. I've got all the pedestrian crashes for the city of Brunswick. Um, I have it from 2013 to 2021. So if you have to get numbers quickly, there they are. Uh, in Sean's last presentation, he said that Irwin Street wasn't that big of a deal. And I kind of wanted to know, well, what's not a big deal? So I went in and looked at the Irwin crossing, the intersection. Two crashes in eight years, not a big deal. Both of which were pedestrian, or not pedestrian, that would be a big deal. Both were property damage only. No, no injuries, no anything. And so I was like, yeah, I probably agree with him. That's not a big deal. So, but that's a quick thing you can just do on the fly. This is great for if you have to work with those people who say, this is a problem. Just pull them up next to you. Don't be afraid of the data. That's been my favorite thing about working with Georgia. This state is amazing at how many people they've got this out to because they're not afraid of the data. They realize the more we use the data, the more useful the data is actually going to be, right? So get that person next to you and say, hey, let's just pull new metric up and look at it together. Um, it's, it's way better than you saying it's not a problem, right? So let's take this, uh, we're gonna take the pedestrians out and I'm just gonna show you, Scott talked about the over-representation report. Let's say I was a city engineer of Brunswick and I wanted to know where to start. I could just come up here and hit download. Summary will give me whatever my metrics are. Comparison would be like a year over year. I could see two years before versus the last two years. Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? So I'm gonna do that over-representation report. Um, So what this is going to do, hopefully we are good connection. There we go. It's basically going to go through and say, sorry, not my computer. Uh, it's going to go through and it's going to say, how's Brunswick comparing itself to or doing against the county? How's it doing against the region? How is it doing against the state, right? And a couple of things jump out to you right away. Well, the state average for intersection crashes is about 59%. Brunswick's are like 71% because the region's high and the intersections are even higher. That makes a lot of sense because there's a lot of foot traffic, a lot of uh, people visiting. Impaired, impaired driving's at a 9%, which also I would say makes sense since it's probably a destination town where people may consume alcohol. Um, I haven't, but maybe. Um, uh, and then distracted drivers as well. Once again, you're in a vacation place where people probably are not very familiar with driving around here, and they're like, this is amazing. I was. I was driving around at like 6.30 in the morning one morning just going, holy cow, this is awesome. Um, but I didn't hit anything, so I'm not one of these numbers, so that's good. Um, but very quickly, if you're, if you're an engineer going in and saying, hey, where do we need to start? You've, you've, you've literally added the filter Brunswick and pushed a button, and it just gives you a hey, this is where you may be out of order or, or outside of what's happening in the rest of the state. Um, let's do another one. And Scott talked about this, the left turn analysis template. So this is something that is actually available for everybody. It was created by GDOT, but any user who goes in and clicks on that home, it's going to be there for them. The thing you'll need to do is once you get it, you go and you make a copy and you change this to, you know, Brunswick left turn analysis, right? And then, yeah, you don't have to. I do so that when I go back through, it's like, uh, it's ready for me. But then you can go in, sorry, let's just, just go into Brunswick again. And what we're gonna do is we're just actually gonna pick a, intersection and i'm just going to take you have a circle polygon here just go and you click on that and there's your intersection that's not a great one to pick 
glad you guys, I mean, that's awesome. It's not a great one to pick. Good for the drivers of Brunswick not running into each other. How about, yeah, let's go here. So actually I'm gonna move this over slightly. Okay. There we go. So there's 25 crashes. Now the cool thing is, is you have metrics. You also have your raw table and your raw table is just all of the raw data. And if you ever want to, and I know most of you engineers do, you can just hit download and it comes out as a CSV. So you can go into Excel and do whatever you want to in Excel. Um, but the other cool thing that GDOT's already done for you is they've actually built this out. Uh, I'm gonna get a, this. So this actually goes through and gives you your left turn. Okay, yeah. Gives your left turn. Basically, where are you having problems with your angle crashes, right? Uh, your left versus straight in all directions. So you can very quickly understand, hey, where the problem is occurring? Is there a problem? And you can understand uh, exactly what's happening right away. So when you do one of these left turn analysis that GDOT asks you to do, is simply go to that template, open it up, go to the intersection, put a, put a, sorry, a polygon there, and then just look at the chart. And you can tell right away, do we need to dig into this or can I print this out? Because you can print this out by just, once again, hitting download, PDF, and forward it over saying, hey, we don't have a problem here, or hey, let's get some more eyes on what's going on here. Um, there's a lot more to demo, but we have five minutes left. I know there's probably some questions for, for these two. So I'll stop there. Um, the one last thing I will show, like Scott said, um, for those of you who feel bad that you weren't one of the, you know, people who was named already and you want to get in, Dave Adams right there. You can email Dave and he will give you uh, access to go in and become, raise that number from 325 to 425. Um, the one funny thing is, is when Dave Adams started, he told me, he thought, he's like, I think there's about six to eight people who really want to know about safety data. And he said, that's been the biggest surprise of his job. And that wasn't with us, but when he started his job and come to find out there's hundreds and probably close to thousands who really actually want this data and can help make Georgia a safer place. So thank you. So we've got a few minutes for questions, Martin. Yeah, they, the, I mean, we still house all the data. So all the data comes from all the different police agencies and then they, they're they obligated by law to submit all the crash reports to us, uh, supposed to be electronically. And then we take the data from those and then we compile it all into gears. And then we do a dump from the gears database over into theirs. And there's obviously some scrubbing of the data that has to happen to normalize it. I mean, there's a little bit of delay. We just released the 2021, but how long ago? Maybe two months ago? Yeah. And so it takes three, four months into the year at least before we're able to kind of go in and clean up the data because there's obviously a lot of issues with it. And so lots of effort on on David Adams' side to be able to go in and do a lot of data scrubbing and clean it all up so that as it comes in, it's reasonable. Now, there's going to be certainly some stuff that you just can't fix. I mean, the intersection like the one he pulled up is, a, you know, at a 45-degree angle and the cop calls it northbound or is it or is it south or is it eastbound? And, and it just kind of depends on the orientation. Some of that is cleaned up. I mean, there's, there's a good bit of it that then go in and try to find it. And then some of it, you, you can't fix it all. And so there is some mining that has to go in. But I still think if across the board, what you're going to run into, and you do see it sometimes in the day of the day, definitely talks about it, is that you've got locations where you've got a city that maybe happens to have or a county that happens to have, you know, issues with the way that they report data. Sometimes you get an underrepresentation in certain areas just because, of the way the police jurisdiction puts something together. But some are a lot better, more progressive, and so they have a lot better data that they input into the system or more fields or, or better in input. And so then that actually helps the data and makes it easier as far as find problems there.
No, no, it's all geocoded. Yeah. It's all lat long. Yeah. It's all geocoded. It's all lat long. It's all based. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they pin it. There there are there are notable issues. There are local a, I, I know of a particular Dunkin' Donuts that has had two hundred <laughs> crashes in the parking lot of Dunkin' Donuts. Um, because the that particular software that was available to and that what that jurisdiction bought is wherever you submit your report, that's where it locks down the actual geolocation. <laughs> They're supposed to do it at the point of the location, and every software is different. Gears actually has the ability for you to go in and pin exactly where you want it. You move the pin around and say this is where it is. And and the and the geolocation is part of the submittal that they ha it's a it's a required field. But a lot of them, like I said, the, the data that they originally had look coded in there. So you you would think if you pulled the data in that particular county, I will not name the county, they said, oh my God, this is the worst location ever. And then you, oh, wait, it's a Dunkin' Donuts. Okay, we're good. Did they go investigate the location? Uh, no, luckily we caught it through our, cra <laughs> through our, through our crash analysis piece. So. Oh, yeah, they went back to investigate, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> I, I would add really quickly is that frequency is a question we often get in terms of the crash data. Uh, we usually do dumps of about a year but it is a goal of ours to increase that frequency. Um, we would like to get it to quarterly, um, and we even have aspirations to getting it to daily. Yep. So that is, that is definitely on our radar. Yep, absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I think my question is mostly for Rob, but I'd welcome anyone to comment. Um, you mentioned uh, looking at your speed limits as kind of one of your initial strategies, and I just wanted to hear about um, any challenges you've experienced in that process and any insights you've learned um, or, or lessons learned from, you know, I know we've historically been pretty tied to the 85th percentile speeds of, of existing drivers, um, but maybe that approach is changing and there's more flexibility moving forward. So I just would love to get your thoughts on that. That's, that's a huge can of That could be in a separate session unto itself. Um, Traditionally, historically, there's been a lot of, of angst and a lot of pushback between the locals and the state. The locals think the solution to getting people to drive, or s drive slower is a five mile an hour reduction in, this, in the speed limit sign. Uh, state thinks rightly from their perspective that the most effective way to do that is to get some police out there mm -hmm. and start writing tickets and that will get people to drive slower. Um, so there's... I've always been interested. I've never done this before. I'm probably going to have a conversation with Scott at some point about looking at our state law and is there a model ordinance from Federal Highway to look at what what does a Vision Zero uh, model ordinance for speed limits and radar enforcement actually look like uh, in Georgia? Is there another state that is closer to that that we could uh, potentially look for to uh, look at things like, and I'm most of the people in this room probably know this, um, with the exception, I hope I get this right, with the exception of the state deputies, the highway patrol that are on the interstates, uh, municipal, city and county police officers cannot write you a ticket for going under 10 over the speed limit. It's, it's using by, radar. Using, using radar, that's correct. Uh, they can pace you, they can use other techniques, but that's, that's directly in our state law that they can't write you a ticket for going eight over. Uh, if you're in a school zone, that might be a little bit different. Uh, if they detected you going eight over using something besides radar, that's a little different. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big enough issue in Milton that we're constantly talking about it. It's just there's, there's always a little bit about that friction and trying to find a middle ground between what can we control, what can we do better, and then what can we ask the state for a little bit of help on as well. I can add to that that, like Rob said, there's considerable constraints related around the way the laws are written as far as what we can and can't do. But there is also a, a, a very strong national effort right now to try to look at is there better ways to be able to establish speed limits. And so um, we push really hard that uh, as the districts are submitting to us, which is then that means that they're probably telling you to local government, hey, you need to add this. Is adding U.S. limits too into your submittal really helps. I mean that it has it pulls in a lot of information about you know, spacing of driveways and crash context and a lot of other features that are in there. And so U.S. limits will really help to not be just 100% focused on 85th percentile, which is, which is a little bit dangerous. But there's, there's a, a whole lot of effort right now. I mean, I just filled out a second survey last week about how do we establish speed limits and 
And you know, there, there's a lot of effort going out by FHWA right now on trying to find a better way to do it. So it comes up a lot in our safety conferences about trying to find better ways to do it. And so, I mean, Sam's gone to those as well. And, and there's a lot of momentum going in that direction. I, I see that being something that's gonna change. Yeah, it's a conversation me and Scott have had more than once. So it's very important to us. Um, it comes down to two things in terms of speed for me. Uh, changing a speed limit just by itself um, isn't the most effective way because uh, it really comes down to driver behavior. And it also ch it comes down to the design of the facilities, the context of the facilities. Uh, I support uh, changing speed limits, especially when you change the context of facilities uh, because it's promoting drivers to slow down. But going back to the driver behavior aspect of it, we saw some crazy trends coming through the pandemic, but people, and still, people are still behaving that way and with more vehicle effort into the outreach as I showed in my presentation as well. Outreach is very important. And that's not just for drivers. That's going all the way down to the elementary school level um, and getting kids to understand what's right and wrong in a car. Uh, and they're built on that. They, they grow up with that. Same thing with Smokey the Bear um, and, and seatbelt laws. These are things they grew up with and understood. And when they finally get behind the wheel of a car, they're, they're doing the right thing. I do want to be respectful of everybody's time. I know everyone wants to get off to either lunch or volleyball or tennis. I think volleyball got delayed by 15 minutes, so uh, you've got 12 minutes to get out there to volleyball. Thanks again for everybody.